Propaganda is everywhere. You could basically call commercials propaganda. Hi, I'm a PC. Okay, we're past that, we can move beyond that. Yeah, I had to restart there, you, you know how it is. No, actually I don't. Oh, what, Max don't have to? But while it's persuasive, it's not always harmful. We're going to look at one of the more harmful sources of propaganda and dive into the dark Russian perspective. How it affects the country's population, the war in Ukraine, and people around the world. Up until the Russian Revolution, propaganda in Russia was pretty much your standard the Tsar said this, so do that sort of thing. But after the Russian Revolution in 1917, things got a little wild. With the toppling of the Tsarist regime, communist leaders of the USSR gripped onto propaganda using it to conscript soldiers during World War II and convincing people around the world that communism was the way of the future, among other things like suppressing language and culture of the Soviet republics. Soviet propaganda was carried out in the Russian language, and countries like Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and Ukraine, who were behind the Iron Curtain, were forced to surrender much of their language and culture in favor of more pro-Russian or pro-Soviet versions. In the 1930s, Ukraine suffered through what became known as the executed resistance. Ukrainian intelligentsia, including writers, poets, and artists like Mykola Khvilevy, Valerian Pidmohilny, Mykola Kulish, and many others were kidnapped and killed by the KGB in an effort to suppress any and all ideas that worked against Soviet propaganda and ideology. Efforts by the USSR to control the perception of the people was something that was carried over to to the Russian Federation after the fall of the Soviet Union. As Vladimir Putin rose to power, he was seen as a savior of the Russian people, someone who would fix inefficiencies, the economy, and lead people to a brighter future. Vlad capitalized this and spent billions building an elaborate propaganda machine to keep the country in check, and for countries beyond to believe in their facade. <laughs> Для, для меня важнее другое – доверие российского народа в том качестве, в котором я сейчас нахожусь. The imagery and symbolism they used often spread to trigger emotional responses from people across the country and gain support for various causes. The Ribbon of St. George is a black and orange ribbon. It was handed out to commemorate veterans of the Eastern Front from the Second World War, or as Russians refer to it as the Great Patriotic War. It's both a patriotic symbol and a display of public support for the Russian government. Since 2014, the symbol became controversial in post-Soviet states like Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and Ukraine due to its association with pro-Russian and separatist sentiments. You'll find many Russians have a strange, almost longing obsession with this World War II glory. Even today, you'll hear people who disagree with the Russian perspective being labeled as fascists, recalling sentiments towards Nazi Germany. The Latin letters Z and V were used during the first days of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It is assumed that the letters were used to distinguish allied forces in the heat of battle. The symbols later spread throughout Russia and the world as symbols of support for Russia's war in Ukraine. Not only have people been painting the symbols on their cars or wearing them on t-shirts, but the symbols have also been used in demonstrations in workplaces, flash mobs, and even schools across the country. It's all very culty looking, but not as culty as the next icon we're going to look at. The main cathedral of the Russian armed forces looks like something straight out of Lord of the Rings. Not to mention it's built right in the middle of Patriot Park. It has this green and black coloration with complex rune shapes cut into the walls and pillars. As ominous as the exterior looks, on the inside you can find orthodox religious symbols, but looking a little closer it gets a lot weirder. The mosaics depicts mobs of elderly people surrounding figures like Vladimir Putin, Shoigu, and Lavrov. You'll find Soviet soldiers, Soviet flags, hammers and sickles, and references to territories that were once under Soviet control, like Crimea. The scariest thing is the display of weaponry, but not classic elements you'd find in churches like St. Michael's Flaming Sword, more like modern guns and rockets. It really looks like a place of worship to glorify war. Russia has been very effective over the years of making up all kinds of narratives that push their perspective and agenda forward. During the first few months of Russia's war in Ukraine, their government closed all independent media sources that were available to the country, Dojd and Meduza to name a few. Uh, now the Russian government, more than ever, has a monopoly on any and all information released to the public. And the media can get a little crazy. Uh, I was curious of all the warmongering leading up to February 24th in 2022 and tried to watch a little bit of Russia 1, which is Russia's largest news channel. Uh, I wanted to see what Russians were being told. 
It's really just a constant stream of half-truths, emotionally hyped up with bits of information thrown at you with no real logical connection, and I'd hardly call it news. Some of the topics were pretty questionable. Дед бывшего министра здравоохранения Украины в начале Второй мировой состоял в бандеровских формированиях. Неудивительно, что внучка участвует в украинском неонацистском фестивале Бандерштат в майке с акронимом WWBD, расшифровывающимся как «Что бы сделал Бандера». Клиническая активистка неонационалистических организаций, без тени сомнения, курировала программы по разработке биологического оружия массового поражения. Это к вопросу о том, зачем нужна демилитаризация и денацификация Украины. Теперь, по некоторым данным, биолаборатории США эвакуируют из Украины в Польшу. Скорее всего, они продолжат работу там. Ukraine's famous weapons producing biolab. This was actually something that Russia started spreading back when coronavirus was spreading around the world. As their story goes, coronavirus was actually produced in Ukraine and then released to the wild in Wuhan. It doesn't take much googling to find out that in reality, Russia was referring to a pretty standard medical lab that runs tests on various bacteria and viruses to develop vaccines. Most developed countries have these labs, but Russia thought it would be advantageous to spread around the world that Ukraine is really the mastermind behind the coronavirus. Ну, я не знаю, як же на це реагувати. Я думаю, що це просто дискредитує тих людей, які роблять такі заяви. От ви бачили, в нашій лабораторії 5 співробітників. Так що, ну, я не знаю, це when Russia invaded, they then shifted the narrative to Ukraine developing biologically modified geese that attack Russian airplanes and soldiers. Geese. В секретных лабораториях укрофашистов разработали специальных боевых гусей, которые сбивают российские самолеты. There's also the whole thing around the controversial Ukrainian World War II figure Stepan Bandera. I say controversial because during World War II, I think a lot of people did some questionable things. I won't dive too deep into the specifics, you can just Google the man. But in a nutshell, he was a nationalist who fought for a free Ukraine under occupation. He died in 1959. In Russia though, the propaganda machine managed to twist that he's still alive somewhere in Ukraine plotting against Russia. Stepan! Yes, I pan. You die! Доброго вечора ми з України. Українці сильна нація, тому ми переможемо. Слава нації. Смерть ворогам. So of course, Ukrainians started singing songs about him to troll Russia because this ridiculous claim really was a long shot. Батько нас Бандера. Україна мати. Ми за Україну будемо воювати. Батько нас Бандера. Посмотрите на лица этих людей, как они поют. Это напоминает такую секту. Украину превратили в, зомб... в зомбированную секту людей. All these interesting stories need to be told. And who do we have in Russia to share them? Vladimir Solovyov. He's one of the loudmouths in the Russian propaganda machine. His talk show on Russia One is called Evening with Vladimir Solovyov. He really likes to keep his viewers on their toes with all kinds of sensationalized outbursts. He loves to beat his chest and brag about how Russia will be nuking countries across the world backed up with detailed animated graphics. Готовы гореть от ударов наших ракет. А если понадобится от использования тактического ядерного оружия. Весь мир в труху, но не сейчас. Да, совершенно верно. Обязательно бахнем. Зачем грозить ядерным оружием? Бескрайней России, сидя на, в общем-то, маленьком острове. Остров столь мал, что лишь одной ракеты сорвать достаточно, чтобы его утопить раз и навсегда. Все уже подсчитано. Olga Skabeva, known to some as Russia's Iron Doll, she's fantastic at taking facts and applying some unjustified reasoning as to why something happened in order to justify Russia literally do anything. And she's very loud. Сначала срочные новости. Украине, малому, не сформировавшемуся, неадекватному молодому государству прощают все. В Украине просто какой-то кошмар по всем фронтам. Хватит смотреть на то, как они нас дергают за усы. Никто из Крыма не уйдет. Рамзан Кадыров. 
current head of the Chechen Republic. He has his own following on social media where he posts all kinds of content. He has his militants shooting at nothing but trying to look really cool while doing it. Making it look like he came to Ukraine himself in the earlier days of the invasion, having his crew film him giving orders in some bunker. <laughs> and fantasizing about capturing Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky. Then we have Vlad himself. We all know about his shirtless displays of power, but he also loves to be filmed at meetings where he makes very important theatrical decisions. Из новых вещей мы несколько изменили границы плана. Предлагаем включить в него аэропорт. И сейчас тоже приступаем к его восстановлению. Putin has been in power for over 20 years. So if we think about it, there is a generation of Russians who grew up under this constant battering of selective information under his propaganda machine. Now that these kids are in their 20s, it's no wonder that they are so proud to go fight for their country, regardless of the reason. They are disillusioned from birth into believing they are superior to the rest of the world. The family structure in Russia is also virtually non-existent because of the constant propaganda. There is just no trust. When the war started, there were many cases of family members from Ukraine calling their relatives in Russia to tell them that they were being bombed. Their relatives in Russia wouldn't believe it and definitely wouldn't do anything about it. Big surprise was that he started to argue. And when I told him, father, Russia started bombing us, it invades Ukraine. And now I'm trying to save my little son and my little daughter and to escape from the key from the bombs. And he said, no, 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 no. He started arguing that uh, in reality, Russia now are saving you from the Nazis regime and we don't have Nazis regime. They're afraid, afraid of their realities, their government, and even their close relatives. After all, maybe their brother or sister might be a government agent. For the rest of the world, this propaganda machine confuses and distracts from real problems. Russia openly invaded Ukraine and is committing atrocities on a massive scale. Unfortunately, there are some global organizations that were once trusted falling for the same propaganda. Amnesty International recently released a report that essentially blamed the Ukrainian government for endangering their own citizens, labeling it a war crime, while terribly underplaying the fact that Russia invaded a sovereign country with their entire army. The Red Cross, an organization that is supposed to save the lives of people in any conflict, they essentially facilitated Russian filtration camps in the occupied parts of Ukraine, allowing for thousands of Ukrainian men, women, and children to be forcibly deported to remote regions of Russia Russia, and subject to stay there for a minimum of two years with no escape in sight. The OSCE had been involved in monitoring the war in Ukraine since it started in 2014, while it was isolated in Donbass and Crimea. But when Russia escalated their invasion to a war across the entire country, the OSCE for some reason didn't have a plan for that scenario, leaving the country and abandoning their Ukrainian employees. What you can do is stand with Ukraine. You don't have to be Ukrainian, but it's important to Ukrainians that they feel the support of people from countries around the world. Recognize and don't fall for Russian propaganda or fake news. Share information that has been fact-checked or has been published by reputable sources. You can donate to organizations that support Ukraine. We'll have a list in the description below. And you can also check your government's decisions to support Ukraine and Ukrainians. Just keep in mind, if Russia stops this war in Ukraine, the war stops. But if Ukraine stops fighting, it will cease to exist. If you liked the video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and tap the bell icon for updates on new videos. And feel free to leave your comments down below. We're going to be covering even more topics on After 24.